So good afternoon. Uh, this will be the first session ever of this seminar in English. Uh, just decided. And today's speaker is Ramon Plaza from the Institute of Applied Mathematics uh, of UNAM. And um, today he will speak about the fusion limits of velocity jump processes for biological agents. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Alessio, and all the organizers. This is the first time that I speak here, and I'm very happy to, to be here because this is like home, actually. I studied here, of, of course. And um, lucky me that I prepared the, the slides in English, and I'm going to be the first ever speaker to, to deliver the, the talk in English. If, um, if you have any questions, or if I speak too, too fast or anything, just let me know. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about, the, as the title says, about diffusion limits of velocity jump processes for biological agents. I'm going to talk about a very precise model, like uh, motivation in order to, to, to present the, me the method. And I'm going to present the method in a very uh, thorough way. I'm going to do all the details just to communicate uh, how this method works. And the idea is to derive mean field equations for its own uh, uh, biolo biological models, starting from stochastic processes that are called velocity jump processes. Okay? So I'm going to do all these derivations so that you have a feeling of the method, and I hope that you find it interesting. OK, so first, uh, let me start with the motivation, the, the specific problem that uh, motivated all this study. And it's about the dynamical patterns, the, sp the spatial dynamical uh, patterns, I would say spatial and temporal dynamical patterns of certain um, strains of bacteria that you can observe in experiments when they are put in a petri dish. Okay? So bacterial colonies in vitro exhibit these aggregation or diffusion patterns, which are very complex. And Usually these patterns are the, the, the result of very hostile environmental conditions. So they put very little food for the, for the, for the bacteria, or the substrate, usually agar, is very hard, for example. And still, the bacteria have very, very um, interesting, complex ways of interaction that produce these complex patterns. They are not dumb at all. They exhibit lots of complex self-organization uh, mechanisms, for example, at the micro level, which is cell-to-cell -cell communication, or the macro level, which are uh, chemical signals and some receptors from the, from, the, from the bacteria they communicate from one part of the, of the special domain to the other, even exchange of genes, etc. And let me give you an example. The strain of bacteria Bacillus subtilis which is very uh, common in experiments. This is a, a gram-positive bacterium, broad shape, as this, this uh, shape like a, like a Twinkie, <laughs> you know what I mean. They have a protective <laughs> endoscope. <laughs> Twinkie is a little cake that was very popular when I was a child. Twinkie <laughs> um, They have a protective endospore, which is kind of a, uh, protection on the on the coat that it makes these uh, bacteria very resistant to very hostile environmental conditions and it's flagellated. So that means that they are very uh, receptive to, to changes in chemical signals in the environment. And in the, <coughs> the usual experiments that you can find with this bacterial strain is as follows. You, you have a petri dish with a substrate, usually agar, and they put some food, which is usually a uniform concentration of amino acids, for example, peptone. And they inoculate in the center of the petri dish with some strain of this bacillus subtilis. These are the experiments of the Japanese uh, group of Okiwari in the early 90s. Okay? <clears throat> so they inoculate in the center of the petri dish, and these bacteria start to consume the food and to start to form this very complex patterns. So there are many observations, there are many regimes depending on the temperature, depending on the hardness of the agar, depending on the level of nutrient that uh, determine how these patterns evolve. Let's suppose that the temperature is, uh, 
is constant. And we are going to vary only the agar, the substrate, the hardness of the agar, and the level of nutrient. So for example, in the low nutrient hard agar regime, they found these diffusion-limited aggregation patterns. These are the, the experiments of Matsuyama and Matsushita and the, the, the group of Eshel Bey Jacob in Tel Aviv University. And the patterns that these bacteria form are, are usually fractal. They are very dendrite-like. And the dimension of the dimension of the envelope front, in the case of high nutrient, or, uh, <coughs> of, uh, or the dimension of the, of the dendrites is usually fractal. The geometry is very, very specific. In the semi-solid low nutrient regime, this is called the dense branch morphology regime, the DBM regime, and this is the regime that I'm interested in. You have usually a smooth colony envelope. If the nutrient is very low, then the bacteria form dendrites. But the, the boundary of the envelope form is smooth. So in this regime, this, uh, this, um, this is the regime in, in which you can propose for example, a PD, a differential equation, in order to model this, this uh, dynamics. The high nutrients of agar is the best possible scenario for the bacteria. They have lots of food. The agar is very, very uh, soft, and they crawl very happily. And this is going to be the region D, OK? And you have transitions between these, uh, these, uh, these regions. And we are going to use two parameters. One of them is the concentration of the nutrient. And the other is the agar concentration. The softness on the, of, the, of the agar is measured by 1 over C over A. Okay? So these experimental observations are usually put in, that, in what is called a morpho morphological diagram. So in the case when you have the, the agar very, very hard and very low nutrient, which is the region A, you have these fractal patterns. This is basically like this. Okay? If the agar uh, remains very hard, but the nutrient goes up, then you have this region B, in which you have, OK, an envelope from, but the dimension of the envelope is fractal again. I'm interested in the transition between region E and region D. Region E is when you have soft uh, to medium agar and low nutrient. In that case, you have dendrites, the bacteria form like these little fingers, OK? But the envelope front, the envelope front is smooth. And if you low, uh, sorry, uh, high, uh, go up in the nutrient in the nutrient level, then you obtain like a kind of a pizza. Okay, bacteria are very happy. They have lots of food. The agar is very soft, and they form these envelope fronts, which are like um, like a pizza with the, with the, the boundary very very smooth. Okay, so I'm going to be interested in this regime. What, the what, transition between E and D. What are the stripe uh, regions? I don't know. This oh. is, no, these like, the stripe regions are like the transition regions between uh, the experimental mm -hmm. observations. The, the experiments are basically A, B, C, D, and E. And you have transition in which you are it's not very clear what happens. Mm -hmm. What is the reference? What is the reference of this, of this figure? The, 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 in the literature? Yeah, from which reference are these figures from? Uh, this, ah, sorry, yeah, this is, uh, um, uh, these are pictures of the actual experiments, and they are here, region E and E. I don't, I didn't write it down, I don't remember, for, for region B, oh, which okay, is so here. There are different references. There yeah. are different references, okay. yes. yes. In this case, this is a dense branch of morphology, the experiments of Okiwai. And, um, okay, how to model this? How to model the dynamics? Which is very good. Right? So there are many ways to do it. Let me mention two of them. <coughs> you can consider bacteria discrete agents. So in this case, you have uh, an agent, which is basically one cell. It's a self-propelled particle, self-propelled agent. They move, they interact with the environment. You have a rule for the movement for each individual cell. And <coughs> Uh, they consume nutrients, etc. And these kind of models are suitable in order to track the internal state of the bacteria. If they die, if they uh, change uh, their composition, etc. Another type of models, which is 
the starting point of, of the study, are bacteria as continuous densities. So you, you can you can suppose that the number of bacteria is approximated by a smooth function that depends on space and time, and you propose a set of partial differential equations, usually systems of reaction, diffusion, or other transport terms type of equations to model the dynamics. Okay? In that, in that case, all the constituents of the, of the model, bacteria, chemical, and other agents are considered as densities. Okay, <clears throat> so let me focus on experimental observations in this DBM regime, which is basically the work by Okiwari and collaborators in the early 90s. In the, in the DBM regime, they observe that the bacteria are inactive in the inner part of the pizza, let's say, and outside. Outside, the, the, the bacteria density is very low, so that, that is, that's understandable. But in the center of the, of, the, of the envelope front, the bacteria are also very inactive. Okay? So that they are very active in the, in the boundary of the envelope front. So cells, cells become inactive again at the out, outermost front of the bacterial colonies, while the de cell density is very, is very low. Mm -hmm. okay? So in order to, uh, in order to uh, um, model this behavior, Kawasaki and collaborators in, in, in the 90s as well, they proposed this nonlinear PDE reaction diffusion system of equations for this, uh, for this regime. Okay? So they propose <coughs> a system of equations for the bacterial concentration, which I will call U, for the concentration of the nutrient, which is going to be P. This is a system of reaction diffusion equations. The interesting part of this model is precisely the diffusion coefficient that is associated with the bacterial density. This is a typical term of, of, uh, of diffusion. You have the flux here, which is a diffusive flux, certain coefficient d times the grain of u, and you take the divergence of that part. That's diffusion. Okay? So in order to, to um, explain this behavior, Kawasaki and collaborators propose this diffusion coefficient. And they say, OK, in order to, to explain this, we are going to propose the following diffusion coefficient. It's going to be proportional to both the density of the bacteria and the density of the nutrient. Mm -hmm. So that when the nutrient is very low, bacteria are very inactive. They don't diffuse at all. Or if the, the density of the bacteria is also very low, they don't diffuse. Okay? So this is, let's say, it's a diffusion coefficient which is nonlinear, of course density dependent, and the generate. It's a generate because when u or v are zero, then you don't have diffusion at all. And then it's going to be complemented by a standard reaction diffusion equation for the nutrient with constant diffusivity d for the, for the nutrient, and a reaction term. The reaction term, <coughs> which is a kinetic term, is going to measure more or less the probability of encounter between bacteria, bacterial cells, and food. And notice that this is some conservation form. So when you increase the number of bacteria because of encounters of bacteria with food, then you decrease in the same amount, more or less, the uh, density of the nutrient. This is a model that uh, proposed Kawasaki and collaborators. And they endowed this model with, of course, standard uh, uh, non-flux boundary conditions and initial conditions. What are the interesting features of this model? Well, it conveys the motility of the bacteria precisely when u or v are low. And <coughs> models high activity in the boundary only. It's valid only for the DBM regime, which is the transition between regions E and D in the morphological diagram. And it provides a complex sense morphology. Not only that, from the mathematical point of view, it's, it is also very rich in the structure. And it has been studied by by Faustino, for example, and other authors, uh, because of this degeneracy of the diffusion condition. Okay, yes. So, very quick, I, I just, I already forgot the experiments. Mm -hmm. The question is, so there's this, this assumption about the concentration of the agar. So, it's in, so the diffusion coefficient, the sigma, I think, in the diffusion yeah. coefficient is inversely proportional to the concentration exactly. of the agar. That's right. Thanks is that me. in line with the experiment? But with all the experiments, because it seems to me that there was one that may have not been 
consistent? This is a, that's a very uh, important question. It's a very good question because it's precisely the motivation of, of the velocity jump processes that I'm going to present. Yes, exactly. The diffusion coefficient is this one. Sigma is a physical parameter. Uh -huh. And they say, okay, sigma is going to be proportional to the hardness of the agar. If the agar is very, very hard, then sigma is going to be very, very low. Uh -huh. <coughs> if, the, if the agar is, is very soft, then sigma is going to be is going to increase. The question is, how do you measure this? It's not it's not so easy. What are the units of this of this guy? So I will go. I will come back to this point, and it's going to be very clear when you see that from a, from the perspective of a, of a velocity jump process. But that's that's precisely the, the, the point. Of this. So what are the, the the features of this model? I already mentioned them, and uh, this is uh, this was the motivation of the uh, the doctoral thesis of my student Francisco Leiva. So we started to review the literature and we noticed that there is also an important uh, factor that has to be taken into account, which is chemiotaxis. So what is chemiotaxis? The chemiotaxis is the movement of uh, biological agents towards some changes, changes in the gradient of certain chemical signals. And this is a very, uh, very well reported phenomenon in biology. You find chemiotaxis in bacteria, of course, you find chemiotaxis in the endothelial cells of, um, of, um, of in tumors. You know, the tumors uh, segregate certain chemical, and then by chemiotaxis, the the, um, the blood vessels are attracted to the to the changes of chemical signals uh, secreted by the tumor, and then the tumor gets vascularized. Okay. Also, some also some uh, bacteria are uh, sensitive to chemiotaxis due to uh, some other agents like uh, fungus, and this is used in biocontrol, and the chemotaxis can be repulsive or attractive. So the, the cells or the agents <coughs> direct the movement towards these uh, high concentrations of the, of the chemical or to the contrary side. Yeah. And <coughs> this, this, uh, this is a review of the literature that, that uh, uh, Paco did in his thesis, he noticed that in the case, in the particular case of Bacillus subtilis, there are a strong evidence that these are sensitive to, uh, to chemical agents. So they show that the, the chemiotaxis is, um, is observed in Bacillus subtilis towards amino acids, for example, the peptone that they use uh, in, as nutrient in experiments. And also, the role of chemiotaxis is very uh, it's very strong in the, in the formation of these patterns. Ben Jacob and, and his group uh, identified three types of chemotactic signals. One of them is repulsive, which is in this long range, by starving bacteria in the center. So there are some bacteria that are dying in the center and they produce some chemical signals that make the other bacteria that are more active in the, in the outer region to be repelled. The other is attractive, it's very short range, in which bacteria in the envelope front ask for help in order to metabolize waste. And the most important one is nutrient chemotaxis or chemotaxis towards nutrients. So there is a nutrient, there is this chemical concentration, and the bacteria they have uh, these uh, flagella, these uh, receptors, and they sense the changes in the gradient of the chemical, uh, of the, sorry, of the nutrient concentration, and they direct their movement towards it. Okay. And <coughs> The second important uh, factor is that based on experiments, Ben Jacob proposed a relation between diffusion and chemiotaxis in certain neutral regions. What is this relation? How do you model chemiotaxis in a PD? Well, this comes goes back to the seminal work of Keller and Segel. So uh, most of you know about it. So Keller, Keller and Segel said, okay, you have this diffusion flux, and you have to add a chemiotactic flux. And yet you have to add the, add the, diver the divergence of these chemotactic flux to the equations. Actually, this is not what Ke Keller and Segel said. And this is a, a, a short comment. Because they, they derive the equations using a, a, a special jump process. And they 
they say, okay, there is a relation between diffusion and mutaxis. And in the same journal, in the second paper, they say, okay, we're going to, 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 to forget about that because if you consider that there are no uh, traveling waves, so we're going to assume that these two fluxes are different. And if you look at the, at the book, in the book <coughs> by Murray, he says, okay, there is a chemotactic flux and there is a diffusion flux. Okay, so let's suppose that we are in the Murray Mur uh, uh, mindset and we're going to propose a chemotactic flux. <laughs> the chemotactic flux in general has this form. It's going to be proportional to the gradient of the chemical, in this case the nutrient. And what is the constant of proportionality? Usually you have a chemotactic sensitivity function, which is a function of V alone, because it depends on the chemical under consideration. And Ben Jacob, ben Jacob and collaborators propose this other, they call it bacterial response function to the nutrient gradient. This is kind of uh, uh, phenomenological, they say, okay, let's propose it like that. And they say, okay, based on the experimental observation, in this regime that we are interested in, the bacterial response function has to be proportional to the diffusion of the, um, of the bacterial density times the density of the bacteria itself. Why? That's a very good question. And this is precisely what I want to uh, to, to answer in this talk and to convey in this talk how to justify this. They say, okay, it's because of experiments. Okay, uh, <clears throat> let's suppose that this is true and just let me give you an example. If we have the diffusion coefficient constant, okay, then using this, this rule you recover the standard keller segel chemotactic flux, which is of the form plus or minus depending on repulsive or uh, attractive chemotaxis, then chemotactic sensitivity function, U times the gradient of the neutron. So it's kind of uh, uh, agrees with the usual models of chemotaxis. Is it correct to think that this is sort of assuming that populational stress in bacteria drives the, the movements of bacteria towards the go in the direction of the gradient? Interest. So, you know, one thing would be to say that there's stress, mm -hmm. and because of stress, bacteria are going to seek and follow the, the gradient, right, or, mm -hmm. or anything that they're pursuing. But there's also this this, this populational component, population component in there, because the minute you put the bacterial density there. Mm -hmm. It would matter if there's a lot of bacteria in the same place and they're all stressed because they would move faster, right. for example, right? right? Exactly. In this case, um, this observation is purely phenomenological and it's only valid in the DBM regime, in which U, the, de the bacterial density, is usually low. Uh -huh. Excuse me. So I guess that uh, this has to be adapted to the case in which you have uh, stress due to higher population. Mm -hmm. right? And maybe uh, maybe the sign has to be also involved if you are modeling aggregation, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> so in this part of the of the doctoral thesis, Dr. Project of Paco, so we decided to include a chemotactic term to the Kawasaki model. And see what happens. So this was the, the, the first part of the, of, the, of the project. So we added this chemotactic uh, term here. Okay. Why? Well, <coughs> we wanted to be um, consistent with the observations of Ben Jacob, so we decided to, uh, you, to, um, to be compliant with this, this observation. And the chemotactic flux has this form. It's going to be the chemotactic sensitivity function, which is a type of lap lapidus Schiller. This lapidus Schiller uh, function is the receptor law, saying that, well, if the receptors of the bacteria are saturated, then they are no longer sensitive to the gradient. Okay? But it, more importantly, this is proportional to the diffusion coefficients times u. So that is why it's sigma, v, and u squared. Mm -hmm. Purely phenomeno phenomenological. Let's see what happens. No? So, as I said, the bacterial response function is precisely like this. 
we endow the system with no flux boundary conditions and some initial conditions up to us. Let me say a comment here. This is the system in non-dimensional form, so the only three parameters that we have are precisely this sigma parameter, Arthur Sofiagar, this uh, uh, chi zero, which is uh, right, is the, the a measure of the intensity of the chemotactic signal, is non-dimensional, and also the initial concentration of the neutron is going to be another parameter. So we, the first thing that we did, so we performed some simulations. This is just um, how we did it. We used uh, graphic, graphic processing units. These uh, patterns are very complex, so you need higher resolution uh, in order to, to capture all the, all the, all the dendrites in the, in the complex patterns. So we use graphic processing units. We use the simplest uh, numerical scheme available. It's, it's compensated by using very short time steps because we have lots of processors working at the same time in parallel. So we can, in order to avoid stiffness, we, uh, or to overcome stiffness, we can use a very small parameter uh, time stepper. And we use uh, a uniform initial con concentration of the nutrient. And as initial um, initial condition for the bacteria, just a Gaussian. So you inoculate in the center of the Petri dish with a population of bacteria, it's just a Gaussian. Parameter values, this is important. We use uh, soft to medium agar, this initial condition, and the chemotactic signal, zero, and other positive values. So basically, we reproduce the model of Kawasaki, and then we switch the chemotaxis on. So this is a, this is a picture that you don't see well, but this is the simulation with no chemotaxis. So this is, this is basically the result of Kawasaki. And <coughs> you see uh, that, um, that the envelope from this is the very regime, it starts to, to grow because of uh, uh, the bacteria, they start to, to process the nutrients and they, they advance, okay? You can see here some uh, morphology in the, in, the, in the colony pattern. You see some dendrites. Let's switch chemotaxis on. So if we, you increase the chemotaxis, then you, the first thing that you see is that the envelope goes faster. So it starts to grow faster. This is no surprise, because if there is chemotax, the chemotaxis and the movement is directed towards the, 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 the nutrient, well, of course, they want to go faster, right? But also, it's, uh, if you switch chemotaxis even higher, then you see that the envelope goes faster, and also you, you see a change in morphology because the, the, the pattern becomes smoother. You could, you could think that it becomes more stable. So these are basically the observations. This is the summary of this, uh, this paper, which is in collaboration with Carlos Malaga in the, in the physics department, and uh, Paco Leibans, etc. So we incorporated a suitable chemotactic term into Kawasaki's model, to perform these high resolution numerical simulations. A numerical observation is the following. There's a change in morphology, patterns become smoother, less branchy, in the presence of chemotaxis. And we, make a, uh, we made a numerical estimation of the, of the speed of the envelope front. We did some asymptotic, some uh, front propagation approximation in one direction, in the normal direction. We have a traveling way. You can estimate the value of the traveling way, and we, with these asymptotics, which are very good, but uh, had a very good resolution with numerics, we proved that the chemotactic, uh, sorry, that the speed of the envelope front is an increasing function of the chemotaxis. So we switch chemotaxis on, then they go faster. The only thing that we could not uh, quantify is why this change in morphology. But it was later on, uh, uh, proved by my master's students, Alex Butanda, we could provide a, a quantitative argument of why this change in morphology happens. So we, in the, in, the, in, the, in the geometric front propagation approximation, we linearize the equations around the, the envelope front, all in one direction. We disregard the uh, transverse uh, uh, 
the component in the tangential variables. So this is an approximation, of course. But the perturbations can be multi-D. So we perform an energy estimate on the linearized operator around this example of front. And we prove that the energy bounds for the eigenvalues are uh, uh, a decreasing, uh, decreasing functions of the chemotactic sensitivity, meaning that you need more energy in order to stabilize the patterns if the chemotaxis is high. Okay. The sensitivity. Excuse me? The sensitivity. Yes, the, ch yeah. the chemotactic sensitivity. Exactly. Right. So what is the, the moral of this story? Okay, we have <laughs> we have these these models. They are all phenomenological. Right? There are many parameters here that are very hard to, to, to measure. So how can we relate this PDE mean field microscopic model to some microscopic properties of the system. For example, like hardness of the, of the agar, and why this relation between diffusion and chemotaxis. So <clears throat> it is very clear there are some situations in, in biology in which the, 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 the diffusion coefficient, the diffusivity, is, um, is density dependent. There are uh, many, many references has been observed in populations of mammals, cell biology, and ecology, etc. A non-biologically related example, which is very popular, is the porous medium equation. You have this diffusivity that depends on the, on the, on the, on the density U. And <clears throat> what is the paradigm? You have this type, this type of equations in which the diffusion coefficient depends on the density. How do we model this? How do we, how can we relate this with the microscopic problem under consideration. So this is <coughs> this is what motivated yeah. before switching to the next part, this chemotactic component that you've added to the model, mm -hmm. a priori you could add many of them corresponding for instance to nice chemicals and bad chemicals, right? The study Right. I don't know, yeah. Right. You, you could add you could have many terms of chemotactic corresponding to Exactly, exactly. There are basically three types of chemotactic terms. Uh, the one over the logarithmic uh, function, that the original by Keller and Segel, Lapidus Schiller, which is receptor, and um, others that... Uh, then, then if you have more than one type of, nutri of nutrients or in general chemicals, mm -hmm. imagine you have U1, U2, and so on. Ah, okay. And some of them are attracting and some of them are Ah, right, yes, of course, you can complicate the model, yes, yes. Just, I mean, yes. you could probably study what happens if you have one new bacteria with one nice mm -hmm. nutrient here, one bad nutrient here, right. and show whether it actually goes toward the, right. the nice nutrients. Absolutely, yes. Okay. You can complicate the model as, mm -hmm. as much as you, as yes. you want. Yeah. Right. So related question, I think it's more or less the same thing. Did you, or are you going to look at the relationship between the sensitivity Chemotaxis and the, chemo and the um, I don't know how to, how to call it. The, the strength of the of the draw from the chemotaxic um, element in here, because there's, there's there's there seems to be this. So if you have if you have more more of a reason to pursue a, a, a gradient via a bacteria mm -hmm. because you're stressed or whatever the situation is, but your your sensitivity is low then you may not be successful and you may be more successful in a situation in which you're not that stressed but your sensitivity is really high anyway. Right. Right? So there's a, these are two conflict, possibly conflicting situations that may affect the patterns mm -hmm. in opposite ways because you make reference to the, to, to the dendritic, the formation of the dendrites, right. but you also made reference, or that's what I thought, about mm -hmm. the shapes of the possible branches that you form when you start forming the dendrites. And those go away when the sensitivity goes up. Right? right. You, could, you get smoother patterns, mm -hmm. but more direct patterns. But only in the in the DBM regime, when the concentrations are low. Oh, for both bacteria. Okay. Okay. And that's, that has to do right. with your sigma. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the answer to, the, to our question is, is no. We are, I'm not going to relate the diffusion with the chemotactic sensitivity. The chemotactic sensitivity depends on the chemical under consideration alone, so to speak. It's going to be related to the chemotactic flux. 
bas basically the bacterial response function that Ben Jacob invented has to do has to have something to do with the with the diffusion. That's it. That's it. Mm. And before that, uh, you mentioned that uh, you could model like eukaryotic cells with uh, mm -hmm. the same processes, but I think you have a lot of constraints in eukaryotic cells that don't doesn't exist in prokaryotic cells. Like for example, the extracellular stiffness maybe is not the same like the agar stiffness, or even you have like ponderated zones of of activity uh, or migration, etc. Not all the cells migrate. Uh, uh, all the, uh, all of them migrate in different ways, so maybe uh, you could, if you are going to model eukaryotic cells by this way, uh, we should uh, cobble uh, them with dynamical patterning models. That is a um, um, a theory by Newman and Bat that uh, talks about all these uh, reaction diffusion etc. mechanisms of aggregation, but adds uh, another so typical of animal. Mm -hmm. that uh, could mm, solve this problem. Right. So, right. because I think there's a big mm, yes, uh, drift between eukaryotic and prokaryotic so cells. Modeling is a serious business. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. I agree completely with you. And uh, I just have to, to say that I mentioned uh, eukaryotic cell bio biology is a, the work by Sangers and, and other authors. Mm -hmm. As an example of a reaction diffusion system in which the diffusion coefficient has to depend on the on the on the density. Just an example of, of that. I, I agree. Okay, so um, oops. Um, if you're not busy you have one more hour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can order pizzas. Okay, you would like to give money more to right. So I will try to be, to be quick. Uh, my idea is to, to, to present this, this method. And um, it's based on the, um, we'll try to model the dynamics of these biological agents by velocity jump process. The main reference is by the paper by Altman, Dunbar, and Alt, the late 80s. And they propose this type of processes in order to, to model the, the dynamics of agents. These agents can be particles, cells, microorganisms, etc. They make instantaneous jumps in velocity. Instead of making jumps in the physical space, they make instantaneous jumps in their, in their velocity. So they are going to a certain velocity, and that with a certain probability, they change the direction and change the speed. Okay? The probability distribution of time between run turning events, which is the mean run time, is going to be 1 over lambda. This is the mean run time. And we are going to uh, use a subset of allowed velocities, which is going to be a compact subset of Rn, symmetric with respect to the origin. Okay. And the probability of turning, of going from one velocity to the other, is going to be determined by um, a probability kernel, which is going to be this uh, function t of v d prime. It's going to be the probability density of turning from velocity v prime to velocity v if a certain reorientation, of course. So the departing um, equation for this is a transport equation. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the details of the derivation of this equation. This was done first by Daniel Struck in the 70s. Okay. And this is called the forward Kolmogorov equation. This is similar as in kinetic theory of gases. You have a transport equation for the density function, which is the population of agents or as the number of agents at time t in a position x that are turning with a specific velocity v in the set. So the evolution of p is governed by this transport equation, which has this form. It's going to be the rate, uh, the rate of um, the evolution of, of p over time is going to be governed by this transport. This is precisely the, the term that tells you, well, these are the guys that are traveling with speed B, minus some, uh, the guys that, that go from B to B prime, right, with mean run, uh, uh, mean run time 1 over lambda, plus lambda times the probability that your population from uh, uh, velocity B prime switches to velocity B. 
G is going to be the reaction time, and we'll talk about it later on. And usually, we're interested in moments of this, velocity moments of this population P. The first or zero moment is basically the density of the, of the, of the population. Is the integration in all positive, possible velocities of the, uh, of the population, right? And depends on X and T alone. So I'm going to present the method of Hillen and Othmer. And they propose a method, this is formal, this is not, not rigorous. It's just an asymptotic expansion of solutions of this transport equation. And they, they lead in a certain diffusion or hyperbolic limit to mean field equations for the, for the densities. In this case, for the zero or one or two order velocity moments. Okay. <clears throat> this is very, this is, if you're uh, um, acquainted with kinetic theory, this is precisely the Hilbert or outer expansion of solutions to the transport equations. So let's suppose that P is a symmetric respect to the origin compact set of velocities. And for fixed, for fixed x and time, you define this operator like this. This is an operator on functions that live only on the velocity space. And <coughs> this is basically uh, all the functions in L2 of P that are positive. And these are the four uh, structural assumptions on the turning kernel. For each t, t is a probability density, has to be greater or equal than zero, and the integral for in v prime has to be one, it's a probability density. If you integrate twice, it's fine. Um, I will skip this, this is not important. This is, uh, this is interesting, you can, this operator you can um, uh, specialize it to the, to the orthogonal uh, space of the constant, and this is a bounded operator. Finally, this assumption is a bit um, strange in applications, but in our case it happens. The integral with respect to B prime and not B. If the integral with respect to B is one, the integral with respect to B prime is also one. Okay, let's assume this, and <clears throat> you define, which is the Turner operator, which is this, um, this is a linear operator, lambda times p, it's a function of b alone, and this integral operator. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because the, 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 the boundedness hypothesis is because of stability? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It's because of stability. If it's, if it's unbounded for a set, what is a small subset in the form of constants, does it work? No. Okay. No. It's to be bounded, yes, sir. Uh, I cannot think of any physical application of but it could be uh, about the operator. I don't know. Okay. So <clears throat> this is basically the, the mathematical the machinery that we need. This is the most important property. Under these assumptions, mu equals zero is a simple eigenvalue of this turning operator. And the eigenfunction is constant. And um, <coughs> another important property is D, when you restrict this turning operator L to the uh, orthogonal uh, uh, space of the constants, then it has a linear pseudo inverse F, which is a bound operator. All right, so this is a fundamental uh, assumption in the uh, modeling processes. We're going to assume the parabolic scaling or diffusion limit, meaning we're going to assume there is there exists a small parameter epsilon such that if we make this scaling, tau is going to be the slow time, it's epsilon square t, and psi is going to be epsilon x, this is a, a parabolic scaling, then tau and, and psi are of order one when epsilon goes to zero. And <clears throat> in the case of uh, bacterial uh, movement, this happens, for example, in the case of Escherichia coli. Characteristic speed is around uh, this, this value. And the mean run time, which is measured in experiments, is around one second. So for, for E. coli, you have that epsilon is 1 over 100, more or less. And for Bacillus subtilis, we have similar uh, measurements. Okay? So 
let's say that for the specific problem that we want to model, we are in this regime. We are in the diffusion regime. Let's suppose this. This is an important assumption. So if you assume this, then you can transform your transport equation and you obtain an equation which is rescaled. It's a new forward Kolmogorov equation, rescaled, it has this form. Let's forget the kinetic terms for the moment, and you have this form. So what is the method in a nutshell, in a, in a few words? The method means you're going to propose a solution to the new to the rescaled Kolmogorov equation in terms of an asymptotic series. A series of powers of epsilon. P0 is going to be the dominant term, plus epsilon P1, plus epsilon P2, etc. etc. This is formal. This is just, this is not rigorous. We don't know if this converges or not. Let's suppose that it's, this works. We're going to plot this solution into the transport equation, and we are going to look at the hierarchy of equations that results from collecting powers of epsilon. This is basically the math. <coughs> Are there ways a posteriori to verify that? Yes, of course. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, a posteriori, you can say, okay, let's suppose that I have a solution of the, con of the transport equation of the kinetic uh, velocity term processes with some boundary conditions, initial, initial conditions, and if epsilon goes to zero, they converge. You can prove rigorously. We have not done that in this, in this case. But in kinetic theory, this is what yeah. usually not. Then you prove rigorously that they converge to the solutions or weak solutions to the mean field equation. But the proposal, and this is for, for the for the for the seminar here, this proposal is only for the modeling process. What is the, the velocity gen process that I have to use? A priori you don't know. So first you use this formal asymptotic method, you derive your a velocity gen process, the one that is going to help you to, to, to model the problem, and later on you prove rigorously that it converts to the solution. This second step we have not done yet in this, in this, in this case. Okay, so the, uh, <coughs> on the last five minutes that I have, sorry, for that, I'm going to try to explain everything. Uh, the, margin, the marginal density is independent of epsilon, so we can assume that the, the interval in the velocity of P1, P2, and higher, they are zero. So the, ma the mass is concentrated in P0. Let's assume that. Okay, so for the case of Bacillus subtilis that we are interested in, I'm going to propose a perturbation of the turning kernel and turning rate, which is of Schnitzer type. The Schnitzer, Schnitzer proposed for another problem in kinetic uh, theory the following. He said, okay, the turning kernel is going to be um, unperturbed. It's going to be a turning kernel that depends on the V and V prime. Okay? But the turning frequency is going to be perturbed in epsilon. It's going to be a constant in V, lambda zero, plus epsilon, lambda one, that depends on V. Okay? Lambda zero, this is, this is very important. Lambda zero is constant in the velocity. It's constant in V. It can depend on other things. It can depend on, on fixed, for fixed time and space. It can depend on space and time. And for the problem that I am interested in, it want, it's going to depend on space and time via the chemical, the chemical signal or the density of the bacteria. The important fact is that it's constant in the velocity. So the turning operator, if you use only this constant lambda zero, goes like this. So this is their first proposition. And <clears throat> if you take a perturbation of turning kernel and rate of Schnitzer type, then the marginal density is independent of P and satisfies this equation. This, uh, this PDE in, in for P0, the, the leading term of psi and T, in the interior of the domain. So this is the, the interior parabolic limit. And what are D and what are the, uh, this uh, WC? This is the interesting part. D is a diffusion tensor. It's a, it's a, it's a tensor that depends on uh, F0, which is the pseudo inverse of the operator L0, 
for L0 independent of P. And WC is known to be the chemotactic sensitivity, which is given by like P. This is a scalar, of course. And lambda, lambda 1 bar, it depends on B, is the average value. OK? This is in general. If you consider a perturbation of Schnitzer type, then you obtain this. I prepare all the derivation. I will skip the steps of the derivation. I only point out the crucial, the crucial parts. The crucial part is if you substitute the Hilbert expansion in collect powers of, of epsilon at order 1, you have that L0 times P0 is 0. So P0 is in the kernel of L0. Since the only eigenvalue, since, I'm sorry, mu0 is a simple eigenvalue, then it means that P0 does not depend on V. It's a constant for fixed psi and for fixed tau, it has to be a constant. So this means that P0 depends only on psi and, and tau. Okay? And you switch the machine on and you collect powers of epsilon and epsilon squared. When you collect powers of epsilon squared, you obtain a solvability condition for the equations, and that will lead you to the mean field equation that you need for P0. Let me give you an example. The equation of order epsilon is L0 P1 is equal to this guy. If you take the L2 product in L2 of V of this left hand side with 1, what do you get? You get 0. Because this product is the same as L0 star applied to 1, comma P1. But L0 star of 1 is 0. Because, as you know, if 0 is an eigenvalue of L0, then it's an eigenvalue of the joint, the overnight joint, if the operator is close, etc., etc. Right? With the same multiplicity and all that. So the solubility condition for this equation is precisely that if I integrate in V this right hand side, it has to be zero. The, co the solubility condition in order one epsilon is not helpful. This can be uh, checked that it's trivially satisfied because of the properties of the term. What is interesting is the question of order epsilon squared because you apply the same the same property. You integrate this in V. This is the L product of 1 times L0 has to be 0. So the solubility condition is that the right hand side has to be 0 if you integrate in V. And that will give you the equation for P0. I will skip the details. At the very end, if you do the math, you obtain precisely that the equation that you arrive at P0 bar is this one. <coughs> boundary conditions. Of course, the boundary conditions that you impose on the, on the transport equation will affect the boundary conditions that you obtain or on the on the mean field equation for, for, for P0. But the, the interesting this was this was very exciting. The interesting part of, of, of this analysis is that only if you assume that there is no normal flux if you impose a non-normal flux mass flux boundary condition for the transport equation, regardless of its form, then it will give you a no flux boundary condition on the mean field equation. So, <clears throat> of course, you define you, you find the traces, traces spaces on, on, the, on the solutions of the transport equation. And <clears throat> I will skip this part. The general form of the boundary conditions for the transport equation has this form P in gamma minus. Gamma minus is, uh, what is gamma minus? Gamma minus is, you have the velocity. And it has some, uh, you, you take the, the dot product with the normal of the boundary. And if that is positive, you are in, the, in gamma plus. If that is negative, you are in gamma minus. So the incoming, incoming flux of cells, which is P in gamma minus, is going to be related to the outgoing flux of cells, which is P in gamma plus, through a linear, boundary linear operator between the trace spaces. So you say that this boundary operator satisfies no normal flux no normal mass flux across the boundary if this condition happens. There are no agents crossing the boundary, basically. They stay inside. Uh, <coughs> regular reflection boundary operators, these are very known for kinetic theory. Uh, are re uh, uh, um, an operator B is a regular reflection boundary operator. If there, are, there is a mapping that uh, has these properties. Okay? Basically, that if you have some velocity v, which is in gamma minus, then this calligraphic v is in gamma plus. They have the same, the same speed, right? 
and satisfied pro properties. Examples, the bounce back reflection boundary condition. There is a particle that comes here to the, to the, to the boundary and it goes, bounces back exactly with the same direction but with opposite, sorry, exactly, exactly with the same speed but with opposite direction. My graph is misleading because I only draw the normal, no? but you can have a particle that goes like this, boom, hits the boundary and then reflects exactly with the same uh, speed but different direction. Another one is the specular reflection, which is the Snell law. Basically, if you come here, then it gets reflected with the same angle. But in both cases, the speed is preserved. Any regular reflection has no normal flux. This is, I put the, the, the proof here because it's really very simple. It's, it's just uh, applying the, the assumptions. But there are other boundary conditions that might satisfy the non-normal flux, which are, may, uh, I'm sure you've heard about them, the Maxwell type boundary conditions that uh, combine the effects of reflection and diffusion. Those, if they satisfy the boundary, non-normal flux boundary condition, it's okay. You arrive again at the non-flux uh, boundary conditions for the limiting equation. And this is the, the content of this proposition. Can you have a sticky condition? I don't know. In the Maxwell, um, I don't know. It, it, but it, I guess that I guess that it could be. I mean, that they, the particle comes and gets stick to the boundary, right? As long as there is no uh, flux across the boundary, I think that it works. But I don't know. Okay, I will skip this this uh, proof because now it comes the exciting part. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Which is. How, how do you choose the turning kernel and the turning rate in order to arrive at, at the model that I previously presented? So, so we're going to assume that S is going to be the concentration of the chemical signal, chemotractant, okay? And the perturbed turning frequency, lambda zero, can be a function of space and time through via S or the density, but constant in P. This is very important in order to apply the, the previous propositions, okay? So the turning kernel is going to be something very simple. It's an upper term from a uniform orientation in velocity space. The probability that you go from one velocity to the other is exactly the same. It's one over the measure of V. How we, do we choose B? B is going to be a uniform distribution of velocities in all directions with constant magnitude, magnitude S possible. It's just a sphere. This is not interesting. This, the interesting part is the choice of the turning frequency. And we base our, our choice in two uh, uh, experimental observations. The first one, by actually very recent, is that the tumbling time is low when the concentration of the chemotraction is low for bacillus subtilis. I have to say that this experimental observation was made for Bacillus subtilis towards oxygen, not towards spectrum. I did some research and I couldn't find that um, that observation in the case of pepto, in the case of neutron. But I assume that it's not so. Uh, this is valid to extrapolate it to, to the case of pepto. The second, the second observation is that to model aggregation, lambda must be a decreasing function of prop, which is something that uh, uh, Marco was uh, suggesting. Right? So <coughs> let's, I, let's propose the following first order perturbation of the Schnitzer type of the tumbling, uh, the tumbling frequency like this. It's going to be a constant over rho times s plus epsilon. This is the order epsilon term. Kappa, that depends on the chemical signal, this is going to this is going to play the role of the chemotactic sensitivity function times V times the gradient of S. Here we are, uh, we are taking S is hat, which means that the dependence of lambda 1 is going to be not only on the concentration of S, but also the gradient or other high order derivatives. And this is what works. This is what works. So <coughs> What is, it, what is the result in diffusion tensor? In this case, since lambda is constant, then the pseudo inverse of this operator is simply multiplication one by minus one over lambda zero. So the diffusion tensor goes, looks like this. 
and at the very end you have precisely this diffusion tensor which is isotropic is proportional to the identity but proportional to the product of rho and s one observation the scalar, this scalar quantity has a unit of square length over time which is effective diffusion coefficient this parameter here sigma which is s square over nu nu zero n measures the hardness of the atom why because if you have a hard medium, then the velocity of the, of the bacteria has to be low. Mm -hmm. The medium is very hard, so S has to be low. And also, the turning frequency per unit mass, which is this mu zero, should be large. I mean, the time that they spend moving with certain velocity mm -hmm. is, is, is low. So lower values of sigma indicate, uh, indicate harder substrate. And for the chemotactic term, in order to, uh, just to finish, um, again, you substitute all the, your, your choices, and you arrive at this. And you have a chemotactic sensitivity tensor, which is this tensor here, is integral of the velocity, with a chemotactic sensitivity function. This is the form of the chemotactic sensitivity. And the important fact, naturally, from this process, you see the diffusion and chemotaxis has to have to be related to each other. This derivation underlies ex the experimental observation of Ben Jacob, which was completely phenomenological. This chemotactic sensitivity depends on the diffusion in this fashion through the uh, inverse, uh, the pseudo inverse of the operator. So, agrees with the experimental observation. I will skip this part. This is the lapidus schiller receptor law. So the model looks like this at the very end. If you normalize it, uh, you obtain the model uh, that I presented at the beginning. I had a couple of slides adding a reaction term, chose very quickly. The velocity jump pro process is Markovian in the sense that uh, there is no history dependence. So it is legitimate to add a reaction term. And also, there is another assumption which is important, and is the following. The number of directional changes outnumber the birth events. So if you have a bacteria, and, that, and this bacteria will have directional changes, how many? Many more than the number of times in, in which the bacteria uh, reproduces. So if that's the case, then the kinetics has to be measured in the slow time scale. So the kinetics goes like epsilon squared. So you have to add the reaction term at epsilon squared. And it doesn't affect the previous derivation. So that's why at the very end you can add simply to the, to the resulting mean field equation the reaction term. Okay. So that makes sense because the derivation process arrests the bacteria. You can assume that the bacteria is arrested in space when the, when the derivation process starts. Right. Just, just in the biology. Right. So, so that limit is actually mm -hmm. should be true. And they they change velocity <coughs> many more times than <coughs> the, the time they are being used. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you make the scaling in order to get the non-dimensional model. It's exactly the same as before. And uh, this is basically the, the proposition. And I thank you very much for your patience and your Attention. There are questions, comments? When you talk about the sample inverse, does it mean that you have an EPOS problem? Uh, it's, a, it's a pseudo inverse because it's only the inverse of the operator restricted to a subspace. The inverse doesn't, non, it don't, it doesn't exist because it's singular. Zero, zero it has a zero argument. So it's a pseudo inverse in the sense that only when you restrict the operator to. Uh, so does it mean that you could have many solutions or no solutions at all or what? Uh, no, the solution, uh, there is one only pseudo inverse. Only one solution? Only one pseudo inverse on the, on the space. So when you consider that the lambda zero is uh, independent of the velocity, then you are working on the on, the, on that space, which is the space of constants. 
in that case, the pseudo-inverse is well defined. If the turning kernel depends on V, then you cannot do that. So that is why the proposal of, of writing the turning rate as some constant in V plus some perturbation. So only for the constant in V turning turning rate you can do that. Because only in that space the pseudo inverse exists. One more question? Yes. About the sticky conditions. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that maybe one particle or whatever goes there, sticks there, mm -hmm. another one points and also sticks there. And maybe you have a deformation and you have a lot of mass in one direction. Mm -hmm. Does it go against your theory or? I don't know, but that's uh, that's uh, that's a very interesting question because you have to model aggregation in that case, and the diffusion has to have a negative sign somewhere. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you if you assume that the boundary condition for the transfer equation has this gluing uh, effect, I don't know. Maybe at the end of the day, during the computations, the diffusion tensor that you arrive at is uh, is negative at some regimes or. Something not like that. Model segregation. Mm -hmm. That's that's interesting. Mm -hmm. well, maybe the, maybe with the scaling factor. So if, it's, if it, the stickiness was modeled simply as a decrease, a drop decrease in speed when you hit the boundary, maybe the aggregation would be an inversion property of the system because they get slower, and if they get slower, the next ones come in. And at some point they can't move, like in traffic problems. Right, right. Yeah, but that, that would be, I think, in another, in another regime. Uh -huh. Because once you... Uh, it starts to dance. Yes, it, it starts to be too dense. Mm -hmm. And I guess that uh, the, the assumptions here and the, the, the measurements of the parameters, they change. If there are no other questions or comments, let's then come on again. Thank you.